Hi everyone, uh, in this session we're going to talk about uh, everything you need to know about fine-tuning LLMs and model merging. Uh, quick intro, my name is Maxim Labon. Uh, I'm a staff machine learning scientist at Liquid AI. I'm also a goal developer expert. I write blog posts on these topics. I created the LLM course, which is uh, super popular on GitHub. Um, I also contributed to the open source community through models, uh, through tools, and I'm the author of uh, hands-on graph neural networks using Python uh, with Pact. Um, so first of all, let's talk about fine-tuning. Uh, we saw a bit of fine-tuning in the previous session, so I'll try to not repeat too much. Uh, but basically, here's the LLM training lifecycle. You see three stages. Uh, first of all, you have the pre-training stage, uh, where you give a lot of raw text to the model. And the idea is that the model learns to do a next token prediction. The result of that is called a base model. This base model uh, is really nice, uh, but if you ask it questions or instructions, it's going to autocomplete your question instead of answering it, which is why we have the supervised fine-tuning stage, where this time we give pairs of questions and answers to the model. And uh, we have a similar uh, training objective, but the idea is that uh, at the end of it, it's going to actually answer your questions and follow your instructions. Then we have a third and final stage, the preference alignment stage, where we give uh, human preferences to align the model to how we want it to behave, and the result is commonly referred to as chat model. So when to use fine tuning? Uh, here you can see a little float chart that I've made. It's very high level, uh, but basically uh, there's a conversation about when to use prompt engineering, when to use fine tuning. I think it's good in general to start with prompt engineering if you can, and uh, the idea is to have a really robust evaluation uh, structure where you have a lot of different metrics that you're interested in. It can be uh, the accuracy of the model. Uh, does it answer my question well? You can create a custom benchmark uh, if you have a very niche use case, or you can reuse um, open source benchmarks. But also in terms of cost, latency, because the question is, is it good enough? If it's good enough with just prompt engineering, then probably you don't need uh, fine tuning. The problem is solved, uh, congrats. Otherwise, the question is, can you make an instruction data set? So can you create pairs of questions and answers uh, to fine tune the model. If it's not the case, it can be for multiple reasons, but it's probably a good sign that uh, you need to rescope the project. Uh, otherwise, fine tuning is an option and you can reuse the evaluation framework that you created uh, to evaluate the model. Uh, so that was the technical answer, but you also have a non-technical answer to that. Uh, here is a report from A16Z. And the question is, why do enterprises care about open source? You can see that the, the two main items are actually control and customizability. And customizability is mostly about fine-tuning models. So even if there's like arguments about the technical side and cost and latency, there's also like a strong argument for customizability and control over these models. So in terms of fine-tuning libraries, I think that you know about Unsloth now, uh, but I'm gonna talk about the other ones. Uh, so TRL from uh, Hugging Face, a uh, great library built on top of transformers, very easy to use. You have Axolotl, excellent library, uh, very versatile. Uh, you, you have a lot of um, YAML config files, and then you have LAM Factory, uh, where you have a really good graphical user interface uh, that is built in. So to talk a bit more about supervised fine-tuning, um, here you see an example of a sample that we, we give to the model. So we have the instruction, which is both the system prompt and the user prompt, and the answer, which is the output. So in this, uh, in this case, the system prompt is used to steer the behavior of the model, uh, think like you're answering to a five-year-old, and the user actually gives the task, remove the spaces from the following sentence. We train the model usually, like generally, on the output only, so we mask the rest, it's used as context, and what we want to, to do is train the model to output the correct answer. Uh, most SFT data sets, I want to, to say that use synthetic data, and that's perfectly fine. Usually it's generated with uh, frontier models, and that's a, a great way of uh, building higher quality data sets. Then you have the preference alignment. I'm just going to mention it here. Uh, there are a lot of different methods, PPO, DPO, KTO, IPO. Uh, in practice, direct preference optimization is probably the most popular one. 
Um, so here you see that you have a different format uh, with an instruction and you have a chosen answer and a rejected answer. So the idea here is that you're going to show like a positive example, negative example to the model. And with DPO, the goal is to make sure that the model that you're currently training outputs higher probabilities uh, for the chosen answers than the untrained version of the same model. I'm not gonna delve uh, too much into the details here, but this is the general idea and can be used to either censor the model, how to make a bomb, uh, the chosen answer would be as an AI assistant, I cannot tell you that. Or it can also be used to um, boost the performance of the model in general. Uh, how to create SFT data sets? So this is a very fundamental question uh, in the post-training world. Uh, and the, the main question is, okay, what's a good sample? Human evaluation is quite bad at um, actually reviewing the samples, but what I like to define is like three main features. The first one is the accuracy. We want the samples, the outputs, to be uh, factually correct. Um, maybe no typos would be good too. Uh, we don't want to compromise uh, the knowledge of the model by giving it fake information. Uh, then you have diversity, and diversity you want to cover um, as many topics as you can. Of course, it depends on your use case, because if you do summarization, uh, you won't be as general as if you do uh, general purpose fine tuning. Um, but it's always a good idea to include a lot of different uh, topics, different writing styles um, in this uh, data set. And finally, you have complexity. I think this one is, is a bit less trivial. Uh, and it's about giving complex tasks to the model, forcing reasoning. So for example, the output will have chain of thought reasoning because you want to train the model to have this kind of, of reasoning. Or it can be tasks like summarization, explain me uh, like I'm a five-year-old. Uh, this kind of task really um, force the model not to only answer the question like a QA with um, answers you could find on Wikipedia. It also forces it to reason over the, the prompt and uh, give a more complex answer. So as a, a little recipe you can see here, um, I would recommend in general uh, starting with open source data sets if you can, uh, combine some of them, then you can apply different filters. The first one is data deduplication. It can be either exact because you want to remove uh, duplicates, we can be fuzzy, uh, so same, um, same idea. And uh, then you have data quality filters. Here you have different techniques, it can be rule-based filtering. Uh, for example, you want to remove every single row where you have, as an AI assistant, I cannot, because people hate it. Uh, but you can also use uh, more clever techniques like reward models or LLM as a judge to evaluate the quality of each sample and filter out the bad samples. And then you can use data exploration with different tools like Lilac, Atomic Atlas, text clustering to have um, topic clustering to visualize your data set uh, to get ideas on how to improve it. And with these ideas, you can uh, go back to data generation and start the process all over again. In terms of SFT techniques, we have three main techniques. Uh, full fine tuning, this is like the most basic one. You take the base model and you just uh, train it on the instruction uh, data set. It has the best performance, but it's also like very inefficient in general. A more efficient uh, way of seeing it is LoRa. Uh, with LoRa, you are going to freeze all the pre-trained weights and you add adapters to each targeted layer. Uh, these matrices A and B are these adapters, so you have um, you don't train on all the parameters of the base model. You only retrain a subset of them. Uh, so this is a, a lot faster, uh, but it can still be costly because you're still loading the entire model in 16-bit uh, precision here. So a more efficient way is to quantize uh, the pre-trained model here in 4-bit precision. This is QLOR and uh, you apply the same idea that you had with LoRa, but this time uh, the, the weights are heavily quantized, so you have a lower VRM usage. But the problem is that it also degrades performance, so there's a trade-off here. Um, I want to briefly mention some hyperparameters, but Daniel already uh, talked about a lot of them, so I, I'm gonna be brief. I think the most important one is the learning rate. Uh, the learning rate is model dependent. Uh, it requires a few experiments to be able to really tweak it and find the, the best one. 
generally a bit of a command to go as high as you can uh, until your loss explodes, like in this graph, uh, then you can uh, reduce the size of the learning rate. Uh, other super important hyperparameters, number of epochs, um, I would say that depending on the size of your data set, you can have like more or less epochs. Sequence length is also good uh, because um, it, it's a trade-off with the batch size because the longer uh, sequence length you have, so the, the bigger the context window, the more VRM uh, you're going to use. Uh, but you don't need to use uh, a sequence length that is as big as the pre-trained model. Then you have the batch size, you want to maximize it to maximize the utilization of your GPUs. Um, and then you have uh, the law uh, with the rank. Uh, this is like quite easy to, to, to fine tune, so I don't want to go into the details here. Um, let's talk about model merging now. So model merging is the idea that you can take the weights of different fine tuned models and you can combine them together so you you just can leverage uh, what the open source community uh, has uh, produced on the Hugging Face uh, Hub, for example. Uh, it doesn't require any GPU, so it's super efficient, and it provides excellent results. Uh, so the OpenLLM leaderboard was updated this morning, uh, so we have a version two now, but this is the version one. Uh, I haven't had time to update it, uh, but you can see that for 7B uh, parameter models, uh, the entire top eight or top 10 is just merge models. Uh, so it really shows that uh, this approach is extremely effective at producing high quality models. Uh, and you can find similar results on like a really a lot of different data sets. I would recommend using MergeKit. Uh, this is like the leading library in this, uh, in this space uh, with a lot of different techniques that are implemented there. Um, so here you can see the family tree of uh, merge models. Uh, so in, you don't really need to see the, um, the name of the model, but you see that every node is actually a model, and we actually merge different merges together until it becomes like a giant family tree. This one is actually quite small, like it can get a lot crazier than that, but it didn't fit in, on one slide, so I, I chose this one instead. Um, about the merge techniques themselves, I want to mention like a few of them. The first one is called SLURP. It stands for Spherical Linear Interpolation. So the idea is really to apply spherical, but uh, linear interpolation uh, with the weights of different models. You can only merge two models at the same time with this technique, uh, but you can really tweak it uh, with different uh, interpolation factors for different layers. Uh, here's a model that I've made in your Beagle uh, 147B, uh, which was a really, um, efficient way of uh, leveraging uh, the uh, different models that were created by the open source community. And then you have there. Uh, so in there, you want to reduce the redundancy of the model parameters. Uh, to do that, you're gonna use pruning. You're gonna select the most significant parameters in your model weights, and you're gonna rescale um, the weights of these uh, source models. Uh, the advantage that it has is that you can merge different models, not just two, but even more together. And uh, I would advise, uh, I would recommend this technique and not with just two models, not with three, but like with seven or eight models. It works really, really well. Uh, so I strongly recommend that. Uh, then you have a very funny um, uh, technique called pass-through. And in pass-through, you can concatenate, co concatenate uh, layers from different LLMs. Um, it can also be the same one. We call it self-merge. Um, and so here you have an example that I've made uh, recently. It's called Meta Lama 3 120B Instruct because I took Lama 370B Instruct and I just uh, repeated 10 layers six times. Uh, so you, you could say like this shouldn't work at all. Like, come on, uh, you, you haven't even trained the model. This is ridiculous. Uh, actually, yeah, this is ridiculous. Uh, people loved it on Twitter and Reddit and online in general. Uh, so it, it shows that uh, there's a lot of things that we can still discover uh, with these merge techniques, with these models. Uh, they do not, um, they can be counterintuitive sometimes, and you can see that this model in particular was particularly good at uh, creative writing. Uh, it was also quite unhinged in general, but uh, really good at creative writing, and uh, now it's being used by a lot of people, uh, even though it's, it's super big. But no kind of fine tuning at all? No, no fine tuning, <laughs> nothing. 
Uh, and then I want to mention the last technique, uh, which is called mixture of experts. Uh, so in traditional mixture of experts, you are going to pre-train a model uh, with a router you can see on the bottom here and different fit-forward network layers. And you pre-train it from scratch. But you can do something quite smart uh, with merging where you extract the fit-forward network layers from different fine-tuned models and you combine them together uh, like this. So we call this a Franken MOE. You add a router, you combine the FFN layers from different uh, models, and this is how you create like your kind of uh, mixture of experts. It's actually uh, pretty cool. It, it works pretty well in practice. Uh, you can see on the left a merge kit config. Uh, for the Beyond uh, model. Uh, so for this model, I selected four different uh, fine-tuned models, one uh, as a chat model, one as a code model, one as a role-play model, and one as a math model. You can see that I'm using positive prompts here. So actually, it's it's a way to initialize the router because if you go back to the previous uh, slide, we can see that the router is supposed to uh, select for each token and each layer where, like, which fit for what network uh, layer is going to be used. We use two uh, in general. Um, and so how do we initialize it if we do not fine tune it? Once again, we don't want to fine tune it. We can, but we, we don't necessarily want to. In this case, we're just going to use these positive prompts, uh, calculate the embeddings, and use these embeddings to initialize uh, the routers. And that works really, really well. So those are two models that I've used. For fixed tool, I had to modify it to make it compatible with Phi2. And uh, that outperformed the base model uh, on a lot of tasks. Um, so it's really a good technique to, to use in general. But I would say that um, if you compare it to merging, uh, as we saw with Slurp and with Dare, I would say that um, if you uh, want to increase the performance, it's better to use uh, Slurp and Dare instead of mixture of experts, because this is a bit more experimental. Uh, this doesn't, this will not bring you the same level of performance. Um, and here you can see the results of uh, the Beyond uh, model. Uh, you can see that the other models I'm comparing to are the source models that I've used in this, in this merge. Uh, so it, it's quite remarkable to see that it's actually performing better than the source models um, on, the, on a lot of different benchmarks. Um, so yeah. That's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you are interested in uh, knowing more, if you want notebooks uh, to, to run some code, I created the large language model course. All these notebooks are available on GitHub, uh, LLM course. And uh, yeah, thank you.